We're going to talk about sound quality, specifically tonal metrics, specifically designed to help us work on tonal noises and assess that issue. So for our agenda, we'll take a really brief review of kind of what is sound quality and what are these metrics, and we'll review some of the, I think, critical aspects of human hearing. As far as acoustics goes, they'll play a part in sort of how these metrics are working and what they're going to be able to do for us. And then we'll talk the rest of the time about these tonal metrics, and there are really only three popular ones, I should say, tone to noise ratio, prominence ratio, and then tonality. And this will be the psychoacoustic tonality that was new in 2018, 2019 timeframe. So with that, let's jump in. So humans and sound. So what is sound quality? If you're brand new to the field of acoustics or noise and vibration, maybe have a vague idea what sound quality is, but Essentially, we like to use this sort of flow chart up here in the upper left where we're making measurements of our vehicle or of our machine, then feeding those measurements either into some subjective analysis, which would be people listening, or we can do objective analysis on those measurements, metric calculation. That's what we're going to be talking about today. And sort of the interplay between these two hopefully lead us to an increase in sound quality. So psychoacoustics is really what we're dealing with in sound quality, and it's, it's the study or the science of how sounds essentially make you feel. What kind of reaction do you have to a certain sound? And then when we listen to those, maybe we do a jury test, we ask a bunch of people to listen to our washing machine, for instance, and say, would you like the way that sounds, et cetera? and they give us their feedback of their subjective assessment. It's really just a listening thing. On the other half of the chart is the objective assessment where we're going to use analytical tools or these sound quality metrics to analyze the sounds objectively. And we use different metrics for different types or aspects of the sound, whether that's modulation or loudness or in this case, tonality. And they're all specifically formulated to draw out the aspect of the sound that they're formulated to identify and uh, sort of calculate for us. So that's sound quality and psychoacoustics in a nutshell. As far as human beings and sound, if I take the human hearing domain and I show it frequency versus level or amplitude here on the y-axis, essentially this blue blobby shape is everything we can hear and everything outside of this in the dark blue area is stuff we can't hear. You know, in a live event or where I can hear you guys talk to me, I might ask you, what does this shape look like? In this case, I'll just kind of give you our most popular answer. And we often get, this looks like the United States and it's definitely de deformed a little bit, but it is a helpful reference, I would say. And if we look at some of the different aspects of the hearing domain, and we'll call it the United States here, there's this section down here. And if you know, we said, what state would this be? This would be kind of, I mean, it's the West Coast ultimately, but we call this the California effect. And if you look at the shape of this red highlighted portion, the fact that I, as I march further and further west along the coastline, in order to stay on land and not fall into the ocean, I have to keep increasing the amplitude or the volume of the sound to stay in the hearing domain. And that tells us that we don't hear very well in low frequency. So anything below really 500 or 1,000 hertz our hearing ability, we get less and less sensitive as you get lower and lower frequency. So that's the California effect. The other one that's really going to play a big part in our uh, listening examples and, and things today is this other region down here, the southernmost portion of the United States, at least in the middle, and that would be Texas. And so you have this portion here. And if we said there's a Texas effect, what would that be? Well, the fact that this dips down, down here, I can hear a lower amplitude noise in this frequency range than anywhere else. So I can hear really, really well in the Texas, in the Texas region of the frequency domain. So we are really, really sensitive to sounds between roughly 1,000 hertz and, say, 6,000 hertz. Our ear hears better there than anywhere else in the frequency range of 20 to 20 kilohertz. Uh, that we can hear. Okay. So the Texas effect is going to play a part in 
these metrics because of that ability to hear really well at those frequencies. So summing up some really high level acoustic summary things that are good to level set everyone on. Human hearing is not linear, either in amplitude or uh, frequency. So in amplitude, we often talk about the decibel or how many dB of sound pressure is that. We use this logarithmic decibel unit or format for our pressure measurements because that logarithmic aspect of the decibel captures our perception of amplitude or loudness rather well. Okay, so we use dB because it's logarithmic and human sensitivity to amplitude is rather logarithmic as well. In terms of the frequency spectrum, we also don't hear sort of on the narrow band frequency. Our brain sort of hears in chunks of frequency and that is what we use the one-third octave bands for. So these one-third octave bands, you see I have a logarithmic frequency axis along the x-axis here. And then I see these orange bands. This is the one-third octave band. And if you have a graphic equalizer, these are usually the center frequencies that you have on that graphic equalizer because these are sort of the buckets of or groups of sound frequencies that we hear in. Our brain doesn't really hear individual discrete frequencies very well. The critical band or bark band is sort of a more highly refined version of this, but the principle is exactly the same. There are groups of frequencies that our brain hears sound in, and that's what we use the logarithmic one-third octave band or bark bands for. And as we just saw with the California and the Texas effect, humans do not hear all frequencies equally well. So this is what we use a weighting for. A microphone is made to measure all frequencies equally well, but we a weight that microphone measurement to more closely represent how a human being would perceive that sound. So with all of that out of the way, let's talk about these tonal noise metrics. And what do I mean by tonal noise? Well, it's noise characterized by distinct audible peaks at discrete frequencies, okay? So I see this sort of general noise level here in this frequency spectrum, but then I see these really thin lines peaking up out of that background or broadband noise, and these are tones. These are one or two or maybe three spectral lines that poke up out of the background and will be heard as a discrete sort of whistle, if you want to think of it that way. And that's what we mean by total noise. It's the opposite of broadband noise, where if you're familiar with white noise, that's equal level at all frequencies across the frequency band. This is sort of the opposite of that. All the energy is sort of concentrated in one spectral line. This tonal aspect, for whatever reason, is really uh, perceivable to our brain. So even if the noise level in a crowd is 80 dB or something, we can hear a tone or a whistle that may be 10 or 15 dB below that overall level because of the single frequency characteristic of that sound. The tonal noise sticks out to us much more than broadband noises do. Okay, so we're, our brain is really good at hearing these and as a result that can make them more annoying or less pleasing to listen to and if, as I show you some of these examples I think you'll, you'll agree these are all irritating things to listen to for long periods of time so if you've ever heard a turbo or a supercharger on a big heavy-duty pickup truck or something it's a really high-pitched whistle that you can hear very very clearly uh, gear wine gears meshing together that that load being trans from one gear to another, those teeth are flexing, and as they mesh and unmesh, that flexing actually causes a, a very tonal noise, which is an, another reason you hear it in electric motors. So if you've ever been in an electric vehicle, there's a lot of electric motors, there's a lot of power electronics going on, and these are all very good at tonal noise generators. And so typically, those are the types of noises we have to worry about until the vehicle gets up to speed, and then we're dealing with the same old road noise and wind noise and things like that. And then our old friend, the mosquito, um, is a very tonal noise and certainly irritating to listen to. Um, and the tonality is realistically only a part of why that's annoying, but it's certainly a part of it. And so we'll take a look at that with some of these tone to noise metrics. Okay, so tone to noise ratio, let's deal with this guy first. First, I kind of want to 
pull apart or separate these first two, the tone to noise ratio and the prominence ratio sort of by themselves, because these two guys are sort of sister metrics. If you want to think of it that way, they're very similar. They're both aimed at doing the same thing. And that is just to help you determine tone or a peak you see in your frequency spectrum, helping you know whether or not that will be audible to a person listening to the frequency spectrum you're looking at. Uh, given the level of and frequency content of the background noise, okay? And there are two schools of people who use metrics like this, those who don't want any tones to be heard above the background, and then um, some of the examples that I show on the screen here, people that really want your attention no matter what, right? You have a fire alarm, you have a check engine light, the emergency broadcast system, these are all highly tonal noises typically for the very reason that they are very quickly observed or perceived and we want to make sure that our fire alarm is effective in getting your attention and so we want to make sure it's going to be above the possible background noise that might be uh, in your environment but their whole purpose in life is to help you decide whether or not it will be perceivable to the average listener Given that a sort of preamble there, it's an important thing about working on tonal noises is you have to consider the realistic background noise, okay? If I'm working on propeller noise in this case, I could certainly measure the, spin this propeller up in this nice anechoic chamber and I might measure this frequency spectrum and I see a, a really prominent tone and maybe some of the, the harmonics of that in my lab and I think, oh man, I've got a big tonal problem but realistically i th have to think about where this propeller is going to be used right it's going to be used and observed when it's in flight on an aircraft or a helicopter or something and so i have to compare the level of the tone to the background noise while it's in use so this situation given the other background noise of the wind buffeting off the body of the airplane and everything else that's going on during flight this tone may not be such a problem. I don't even see this harmonic anymore. And so when we're measuring or assessing these tones, we need to do it in an appropriate environment, which includes the background noise that will be present when our, our customer or our listener is going to be hearing it. This first one, tone to noise ratio, this and prominence ratio, and actually the psychoacoustic tonality are all described in this ECMA 74 noise standard. It's a standard that you can view and publish and read at night to help yourself fall asleep. But this standard describes the calculation both for tone to noise, prominence ratio, as well as the psychoacoustic tonality. And essentially what tone to noise ratio is doing is it's looking at the level of the tone and comparing that to the noise level or the background noise in that same critical band. Okay, so there's, there's that word critical band. This is a chunk of frequencies centered around the tone that are in the same sort of bucket that our ear would hear. And so for tone to noise, I'm looking at the amplitude of the tone, we're calling that T. And then I'm looking at the amplitude of the masking noise or all the other spectral lines in here with the exception of this. We pull the tone out and then we add up all the levels of these individual frequency lines in this same critical band. We call that level M. And the difference between those two is the tone to noise ratio. And so if my tone sticks out enough above that, or if there's very little masking, other noise masking around that critical band, and this is very low, it's very, very likely that I'll be able to perceive that tone given everything else that's going on. And the standard will look at the threshold values, and these will be averages over a bunch of different human subjects. Everyone's a little bit different. But essentially, if it crosses some threshold, which we'll discuss in a minute, we'll call this tone prominent, and it will be able to be heard as a pure tone in the rest of the noise spectrum. That threshold is a function of frequency, which I'll show you in just a minute. The thing about the tone to noise level uh, or tone to noise ratio is if the tone is, let's say, 9 dB above the critical band in this case, and just for an example, the tone to noise ratio will always be reported as 9 dB. So it doesn't matter if that's the tone is 59 
decibels and the background noise is 50 decibels or if it's 159 for the tone and 150 for the background. That tone to noise ratio will always be reported in those two cases as 9 dB. As we'll see further down the road, that may not be in our best interest to call those two scenarios equal in terms of prominence of that tone. Okay. One of the other things that I'll caution you on this method is this last point here. If there are multiple tones in this same critical band, so in this red band here, if there was another, if this guy right here was a higher amplitude, tone to noise ratio is going to say, yeah, this guy's maybe at the end here in the word tone. So it's pretty t prominent, but it's only going to say, well, this guy's way bigger. This is the only one I'm going to consider. Okay, so if you have multiple tones in the same band, it only looks at the biggest one and it and calls everything else the background noise. Something to be aware of. The threshold for tone to noise ratio, if it's a, at or above this line, 8 dB above uh, 1000 Hertz, so it's pretty flat above 1000 Hertz, but you see that prominence has to be higher and higher the lower we go in frequency because of that California effect. Okay, we just don't hear very well at low frequency, so the tone's got to be more and more prominent and, and for it to, to throw a yes for that threshold, okay? So that's tone to noise ratio. Its sister is prominence ratio. It's very similar. It's also described by ECMA 74. And in, here, instead of it being a tone to band comparison, it is a band to band comparison. So prominence ratio says, I find a tone, I look at the level of that critical band that is centered around that tone, and I compare it to the average of its two neighboring masking bands. We'll call those A and C. The difference between these is the prominence ratio, but it's really the average of A and C. In this case, I've shown on purpose A and C being the same, so their average would be equal to either A or C, and the difference between B, the band that contains the tone, and those masking bands A and C, that is the prominence ratio. If A was up here and C was where it was shown, the prominence ratio would be somewhere in the middle between A and C. It's an average there. So this is a band-to-band -band comparison as opposed to a tone-to-band comparison. One of the really nice things about this is this last point, so I'll jump ahead a little bit, but if there are multiple tones in this same critical band, so again, if I take this guy and say he's really up here, that, that's all in the same sort of green critical band here, and so all that's going to happen is this level's going to go up, and these two red masking bands would stay the same. And so if I've got multiple closely spaced tones, all that does is make this band more prominent given the level of background noise, which is probably what I'm going to want because I've got more things going on in that critical band than just the biggest one. Very similar to tone to noise. Again, B is 59 and the average of A and C is 50. The prominence ratio will again be reported as 9 dB. If I turn that volume of everything way up and the level of B is 159 and the average of A and C is 150, the prominence ratio is still 9 dB. So the same exact thing we saw with tone to noise ratio. For prominence ratio, it's very similar. The threshold for prominence is 9 dB at 1000 Hertz and above, and you see a similar sort of increasing level as the frequency drops. These are the threshold levels where essentially the prominence ratio or the tone to noise ratio will tell you, yes, it's a problem or no, it's not. If you're a fan of our community, or if, even if you're not, you're not even sure what it is, this is a web site you can look at, and uh, we have an article specifically about these two metrics, so you can go read more about it, see some examples, etc. Feel free to go check that out. Uh, one of the nice things about prominence ratio and tone to noise ratio is they work in active picture. So if you are not familiar, an active picture is a test lab picture that I can put here in my PowerPoint and I can double click on it and it'll essentially activate that picture. And now I can, I can do things like zoom in on this. I could, but it's essentially a test lab plot or picture here in PowerPoint. So I could, I could make this plot. I could change this amplitude here. 
um, if I wanted to. I don't want, really want to do that. I can A-weight it. I can do all kinds of stuff. And essentially, I could send this PowerPoint to my boss or someone who doesn't have a license of Test Lab. And as long as they have a little add-in from our website, they can open up this plot and do all the same stuff. Okay, so all the information of the Test Lab display is built in here, including this sort of spectral analysis processing cursor that we can put in here. And so you see, this is our good friend Vacuum A. If you're aware of, been around for any length of time uh, for our acoustic seminars, you've heard this vacuum cleaner. And we know it's got tonal problems. And we can kind of tell by looking at the spectrum here that it's got tonal problems. But if I put this cursor on here and I go over to one of these peaks, you notice prominence ratio doesn't even show up here, okay? And that's because this critical band out here at 16,300 hertz, so these bands are getting pretty darn wide. And you see I have a pretty high level here, uh, more lower in frequency than these guys, but it's saying that the band that this tones in just doesn't have enough prominence to even register as a prominent problem. Tone to noise will calculate it for you because it's just looking at that single line, right? It, and it says it's not very prominent though. It's only 1.4 dB above the background, again, probably because of this content here. So it says, no, it's not prominent. If I go down here to this guy right here in the middle of Texas, 5,400 Hertz, maybe not the middle of Texas, but somewhere in Houston, maybe, we know this guy is prominent and know that we hear really well in this frequency range. And so prominence ratio, is it prominent? Yes, it tells you, yes, you've got a problem. It's 12.8 dB above the background at this frequency. Now, interestingly, the tone to noise ratio says I'm only 4.6. And if I move this over, that will get a little bit higher, 7.6. So that's just below that threshold of eight decibels. So this guy's on the verge of becoming prominent. So this guy, again, if I don't know that eight dB threshold, I might be fooled by this tone to noise ratio. And I think what's going on here is if I zoom in here, I've got, you know, depending on my frequency resolution, I've got spectral lines that are pretty high amplitude in here, right? So it's looking at this peak amplitude and comparing it to the level of the band. The band is comprised of this guy and maybe these data points out here. And so it's just saying this single data point up here isn't enough above these neighbors to really be considered prominent yet. One of the reasons I like prominence ratio more than tone to noise is for this very reason. It's looking at a band and the, if there are multiple tones, it counts those towards the prominence, which I think is a little bit more realistic. So that's an active picture, and these things can be used right there in the active picture. So you can send some plots to your boss and sound smart. Uh, and just maybe display how smart you really are, not to <laughs> say you're not smart. So if I were to do a demo here in some Center Test Lab Neo, I've got this EV run up. And if I show you the time data here, I've got a taco and this noise, and I'm only gonna play this for you once because it's pretty tonal uh, as, as you might expect from an EV, but this is a sort of an open chassis EV. So everything's uh, heightened and much more clear than it may be in a regular passenger car EV. So here we go. Okay, I think that's enough of that. It doesn't get any better uh, as the RPM creeps up to the top there. But so obviously we have a bunch of tones in there, right? So if I show you the process that I use to analyze this, this is that process over here. So essentially I put the tachometer and that gearbox microphone in the input basket. I sent it through a spectrum map. So we'll look at that first. I also put it through prominence ratio and tone to noise ratio map which we'll talk about first and then a little bit later we'll talk about this tonality but if i look at this spectral map 
you can see we've got all kinds of stuff, right? We've got our typical sort of orders that go through zero RPM and zero Hertz, these diagonal lines. But you notice we also have this EV stuff out here where we have sort of off center or off axis order content that are both going up with increased RPM as well as going down in frequency with increasing RPM. So this is a little bit different, a problem really not found in typical combustion engine, sort of historical automotive noise and vibration stuff. This is all a function of the EV and the power electronics we use to power the motors and things. We have a bunch of tones out here. If I zoom in, I can put a, a cursor on here and I can say it's an order cursor. And you notice this is trying to go through zero Hertz and zero RPM. I can double click on that and set an offset. I happen to know this is about 9950 and it's sometimes hard to find, but it's way down here. Let me double click on that again. and I'll do first order off of that. Okay, so now it is centered around that 9950 and I can see that I have both, maybe I'm a little off center here, um, but you see I have positive and negative. So this is basically 47th order and there's a positive and a negative version of that. But if I look out here, I've got a ton of tones going on. I've got these other rising tones in this frequency band. So I've got a, a ton of stuff going on here. So what I'd like to do now is show you the tone to noise map with this spectrum map. So let me uh, add this guy right here, tone to noise ratio map. Okay, so again, this tone to noise ratio map is looking at every RPM step that I calculated a frequency spectrum over here. It did a that tone to noise metric, okay? So it certainly sees these more engine-based orders down here. He says, yeah, I've got real tones and yes, they are prominent. I've set my scale to be that eight dB. So if you see red here, that is our threshold of being prominent, meaning we can very likely hear it. And so you see, you definitely see, so if I put a, whoops, I want a coupled cursor in the frequency domain. So now this cursor will move back and forth. So if I go to this area here, I see, oh yeah, I've got a problem in this critical band out here and it's really this cluster of a bunch of different tones whereas if i go down here i might fool myself and say oh it looks like i've got a tone out here it looks like there's a single tone in this critical band both a positive and a negative version of that but if i zoom in on this i see that it's really multiple frequencies in here and so I might be being led a little bit astray by this tone to noise and saying, yes, I've got a tonal problem. I've got actually a bunch of tonal problems. And a couple of these, so they stay together. So let me show you the prominence ratio map as well. So this is, let me turn off tone to noise for now. Oops, I did that exactly wrong. So this is spectrum map and prominence ratio map. And this does a lot better job, in my opinion, of saying I've got a very big tonal problem here and it's not just a single tone, it's a whole bunch of tones in this critical band that's keeping it prominent, okay? Because of this, the closely spaced nature of these tones in this EV noise, it's showing me that I've got multiple tones per band. So that single tone, tone to noise ratio might be misleading me a little bit. Here's one example of why I like prominence ratio a little bit. I'm a little bit more in favor of it. The nice thing about it is I can add both methods, calculate them both at the same time and see which result I think reflects what I'm hearing better in my given, given measurement. So that's tone to noise and prominence ratio. Now we'll jump into this last metric, and this is the hearing model tonality, or TUHMS is its unit. And this was new in a couple revisions of Test Lab ago in 2019. This method is also described in ECMA 74, NXG and F, sort of the F is sort of outlines the hearing model, and Annex G of ECMA 74 applies that hearing model to the perception of tonality.
as a result of this hearing model, we get a new tonality unit, this TU, tonality unit, HMS, meaning it's based on the hearing model of Sawtech, the researcher that developed this hearing model and this whole approach. The nice thing about TUHMS is that it much more closely relates to human perception. If you're a longtime user of Test Lab, you know we've had a ORAIS tonality in Test Lab Classic for a long time that also used tonality units of TU, but essentially it was a, a number between zero and one, one being all tones, zero being no tones, and any amount in between. This is a little bit more highly attuned metric for human hearing, and it captures some of the aspects of how we hear and how we hear tones very, very accurately. One of the big things is that tones that are louder will receive a higher TUHMS value. With the old tonality, if you got a tonality of one, again, that's the biggest that number ever got. TUHMS will keep going up theoretically forever. If I keep making the tone louder and louder and louder, above the background, that's going to be obviously more and more annoying and perceivable, and TUHMS will reflect that. And I'll show you an example of that in just a second here. We can also look at the tonality versus frequency or the specific tonality, and it, that will show me on a bark band or a frequency scale where the tonality or the tonal characteristic is in the frequency domain. So not only does it give me an amplitude, but it tells me where it is, that that is a new aspect of this metric. Some threshold values to keep in mind as we're looking at some examples. Point 0.1 TUHMS is considered to be the threshold of where it's barely noticeable. Someone who is not a trained listener may not be able to hear the tone in there if you calculate point 0.1. And so once you've heard it a while, you can probably pick it out if it's point 0.1 or above. Point four, it's definitely perceivable by almost everyone, and it starts to become something you, you need to worry about because it's more objectionable. If it reaches a level of 0.8 or greater, you've got a serious, really annoying tonal problem to work on, 0.8 or above. Okay, so just keep those threshold values in your mind as we listen to some examples here. But first, I want to show you this scaling aspect to TUHMS. If you just look at the red for right now, it's pure broadband noise, so no tones for this first section. Then I add in some tones on top of that broadband noise for this middle section. And then I drop the background broadband noise out, and it's just pure tones here for this last segment. And the green is just that same exact recording I just scaled the amplitude down. I just made it quieter so the level of the noise and the level of the tone in the noise both drop by the same amount. And so if I calculate TUHMS for this, you see that reflected in the amount or the amplitude of TUHMS that it calculates. You see essentially zero here, you know, where it's broadband noise, it's zero tonality. I throw some tones in there and they both jump up, but you notice the, the louder one calculates more TUHMS. This is exactly what you would perceive or you'd say if I played these for you at the two different levels. The red one sounds like it's more tonal to our ear just because of that change in amplitude. And then the broadband noise goes away and we have flatline tonality. It's not changing anymore. So TUHMS does a good job of capturing this amplitude sensitivity. It also does a good job of our frequency sensitivity that California and the Texas effect are sort of built into this metric very, very well. Very simply, the major steps of this arithmetic that goes on behind the scenes, we do some filtering for the, the middle and inner ear. We then divide the frequency spectrum up into 53 critical bands. We're used to seeing 26 but we actually split them into half critical bands, so we're gaining back a little bit more resolution. So we split into half critical bands. We do a specific loudness calculation that will take into effect that frequency dependency of our hearing ability. And then we separate the tones from the background noise, and then we compare the specific loudnesses of those two components. That's everything that's going on, and then it spits out a TUHMS value for us. So I'll show you this in the software again. Certainly, I can show, I'll show you this 
for this EV. So this is a tonality map. So now it's frequency along the x-axis here. RPM again on the y-axis and tonality shown in the color scale. And you look at this and you're like, no, that's not bad. There's like really only one little tonal problem. And if we hadn't heard this vehicle already, you might fool yourself into believing this. Like, oh, I see a lot of cool blue. I don't have a problem. But then I come over here and I look at the amplitude and red is 23 ton tonality units HMS. Our threshold for a serious problem is 0.8, remember? So if I change this to be, I'll even go up to one, we see <laughs> more of what we perceived when we listened to this, right? It's nothing but tone problems all over the place. And so this guy does a really good job, not just of the individual bands to its neighboring bands, but it highlights all of this other stuff down here that we can hear even better than prominence ratio did. I think of tonality, uh, at least the hearing model tonality, as being all the good parts of tone to noise and prominence ratio, plus you have all of this higher accuracy for the real perceived listening aspect of tones and how we hear them. This guy is so tonal, it's not even kind of fun to work on using tonality. So I'll show you some more uh, subtle issues. This is a an industrial fan. And if I show you the spectrum map of this guy, one of the interesting things this is a binaural recording. And I'll show you, if you listen to this, the right ear has a really different character to it than the left ear. So we'll focus on the right ear for this guy. But if I show you the spectrum, you think, wow, it looks like a lot of broadband noise. You know, let's zoom in down here. There might be some tones that we have to worry about. But again, they're not super high amplitude. Doesn't look like a big deal, right? So uh, what I'll do is I'll just play you the right ear and take a listen to this guy and see if you hear any tones or tonal problems in this recording. <laughs> Okay, so depending on how well that comes across and what kind of speakers maybe or headphones you're listening to, I can definitely hear some tones in there. But again, the frequency spectrum is not really helping me too much. So I'll look at this tonality map here. And it definitely shows that I've got some problems. So I again, I have my scale at zero to one. So anything red is a definite problem. And so I see some tonal issues down here if I throw a cursor on here looks like it's about a thousand hertz right really the beginning of the texas effect we hear pretty darn well at a thousand hertz and so i've got this thing going on i've got something else maybe at 500 hertz and so what else i can do is i can show tonality versus time so i'll actually show left and right here ear and you see the left ear is in red and the green is the right ear and you see this sort of modulating tonality so i'll play this one more time for you and watch this green trace and this is tonality units versus time and you see it's peaking up here right around two tonality units so pretty pretty tonal pretty irritating tonality and see if this kind of matches your perception here <laughs> So if I put, put the tonality versus time for the right, and I'll also do the spectral map here. And then I'm going to turn on some audio replay filters here. And this will allow me to filter out some frequencies while we're going here. Now let's just make this 2000 for right now. So I can turn this filter on, I can move this around. So 
So hopefully you can hear that tone coming and going that really sort of corresponds to this high tonality and it's this thousand hertz frequency band. I'll start it over one more time here. Okay, so tonality versus time kind of tells me I've got a problem. It tells me the sort of the amplitude or magnitude of that problem. I can also look at tonality versus frequency, where this is frequency along the x-axis, and then I've got tonality units in the y-axis, and I see I've got a main area of concern, and I'm, I'm guessing this is 1,000 hertz, and yep, in this 1,000 hertz area. So this tells me where to start looking and playing around with some filters and saying, if I took that 1,000 hertz tone out, how much does this improve? And I can do that sort of what-if scenario just by throwing some filters on and, and listening to it during playback. This next guy, <laughs> this is the mosquito. We've had this mosquito example in our sound quality metrics seminar for a while, and I've never really analyzed the signal, so I thought I should do that. So if I show you the tonality map for a mosquito, you see we do have some problems. I'll put this in free. And yeah, so red is now two. And I think you'll agree this is pretty tonal. So this is a live spectrum. Obviously, I've paused it here, but you see uh, a bunch of harmonics of this fundamental frequency. So there's a ton of tonal energy in the mosquito noise, and we perceive this, and it sticks out, and prominence ratio would probably tell us we have a lot of prominent tones here. And I think that matches our, our perception pretty well. If I do tonality versus time for this guy, again, I can get a nice 0.9. So this 0.9 here is the statistical value, the RMS over the, the time here. So 0.9, so that's just over that 0.8 threshold for a you know sort of big problem or a problem we want to work on. So sort of verifying that Mosquitoes are annoying, not just because of the itchy bites, but because of the noise they make in our ear. And then lastly, I'll play you a recording of a refrigerator. Again, definitely hear some modulation in the recording, but I don't know that I would necessarily pull out a, a tonality problem right off the bat. Let's see what you guys think. The more you listen to it, again, it's dominated in my mind by the sort of the the modulated you know aspect to it. But if I look at tonality versus time, I definitely see that modulation part in there. But it's definitely telling me I've got tonal issues in there, right around that 0 0.4, 0 0.5 threshold where it's going to be perceivable by everyone, whether or not it's dominant enough to be annoying. I guess it's a matter a little bit more of subjective opinion for this guy. If I look at the tonality map, we'll see something similar where none of the magnitudes are, are big enough to really stand out and tell me, yeah, I've got, I definitely got a tonal issue. But I think once I start playing this back and filtering some noises out, I think it'll help you key in on the part that I think is a tonal problem. And once I sort of point it out to you, I think you'll agree that it did have a tonal problem. And now that I know that it's there, I find it even more annoying. So I'm gonna open this up to uh, the full band and I'll start playing this. <laughs> This is my cursor down here, or my filter.
I think part of the reason this doesn't rank as high as I kind of subjectively would like it to is because of the frequency content. It's, you know, 9, 10, 11 kilohertz, which is certainly east of the Texas region, but is also still pretty annoying. And uh, but once I filter it out and I listen to it with and without that sort of tone coming and going, I think that's what's really driving this aspect of the tone. And if I look at tonality versus frequency, I see this is, there's definitely some combustion orders down here that are also tones, but you see that it's got a bunch of tonal energy concentrated out here in this high frequency range. And that's really what I key in on as being the most annoying. I'll try filtering out some of these other guys here. So let me do this guy. Uh, tonality map. So I do hear a tone coming and going there, but... That low, low tone doesn't, doesn't bother me nearly as much as this sort of chirping high frequency guy out here. Even the tonality map isn't necessarily telling me exactly where to look. I can look at tonality versus frequency and that helps me understand, you know, the relative amplitude of the tonal components here. Tonality versus time might help me see that, yep, it does have this really fast acting coming and going, which it's almost like a chirp that comes and goes over and over. And that I, that's what I find particularly annoying about that recording. That's a little bit about tonality and the tonal metrics. If I were to show you just for, for fun, prominence ratio map, tone to noise ratio map, again, tone to noise, it's not a single tone in there. It's more of like narrow broadband that has a tonal quality. And so tonal tone to noise doesn't do a good job of pulling this out at all. Prominence ratio, I think, does a really good job because it's a critical band comparison to its neighboring bands. Something like this noise per in particular can stick out a lot more with prominence ratio. All of these things that I've been showing you, I calculated using this process here. I did a spectrum map just to take a look at the regular sound pressure stuff. And then I did tonality map, prominence ratio map, and tone to noise ratio map. From the tonality map, I can pull tonality versus time, tonality versus frequency, and then this tonality frequency, which is kind of showing me as a function of time, where is the tonal energy concentrated? You can see it's jumping around back and forth between that high frequency end and that low frequency kind of sort of combustion tone that we see at the very bottom of the, the frequency spectrum. Those are sort of the tonal metrics that you'll find in Tesla Neo. That brings us to the end of the webinar. My email and peer, if you have any questions about these metrics or anything else, please feel free to reach out. I'd be happy to help if I can. Feel free to rewatch and review anytime you like.